Hello, welcome to the channel. Today what we're going to talk about is stateful and stateless workflows and how they can work together. Let's go. So we do see, receive a lot of requests about how we can improve some of the Logic App standard characteristics. So sometimes people are saying, hey, I'd like to reduce my storage cost because with Logic App standard, you bring your own storage. If you are processing a lot of stateful workflows, naturally those inputs outputs get stored somewhere that's in the customer storage account and naturally if you have a large load your storage requirements go up as a result of that so that might be something people are looking to uh, reduce another situation might be i want to improve throughput so i'd like to complete a workflow in a shorter amount of time and you know just a little bit of background when we do talk about stateful workflows we have this notion of checkpointing. So we basically checkpoint at every single action and that's what allows us to have durable processing and avoid any sort of message loss or even in the event of like retries, we have state persisted. And so as a result, there's a, 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 a computing cost for that because we have to continue to talk to storage. So there's gonna be some additional overhead that's involved in that. that. That overhead ultimately will reduce your latency. So if you've got like request response scenarios and you've got an end user waiting at the sort of end of that request and you've got a long process with sort of many steps within it, we are going to round trip to storage several times because durability is our top priority. Now, by going ahead and uh, addressing these requirements and how these typically get addressed is through stateless workflows where we don't have that checkpointing step by step. Uh, we do lose some things. We gain some things by, hey, not putting as many things in storage, by improving throughput because we're not doing so many checkpointing, by reducing latency, but we therefore can't report on the workflow status. It's basically a blank screen, right, when you go into run history. Uh, the other thing is we can't provide you the inputs and outputs because those are in storage and that's what we're trying to avoid is that round tripping to storage. So the question becomes, all right, like what do we do? And so there is this, this pattern and I've seen some customers leverage this and I think for some people there might be a perception of like I have to use one or the other, but the reality is is you can use both and you can take advantage of best of both worlds. So if we think about a stateful workflow that calls a stateless workflow, is sort of the secret recipe here. Well, it's not really secret, but that's the recipe here. So stateful, we still get some element of durable messaging. So there might be pieces of your process where, hey, durable messaging is really important to me. Uh, run history, whether being able to determine whether or not your process executed successfully is, is gonna be important to you. So you can go ahead and see that. If you need to resubmit something, you can. Uh, with stateless, because we don't have that record in storage, in run history, we can't go ahead and resubmit. And then just overall visibility, we will still get that with stateful. Now from a stateless perspective, what we can do is put the parts of our process where we want to reduce latency, where we want to reduce the verbosity of storage logging that needs to take place. And when required, we do have the ability to opt in or enable just in time debugging for troubleshooting purposes. Now don't turn on debugging in a production environment and leave it on like you're you're asking for troubles it was not designed for long-term usage it's more designed for troubleshooting from that perspective so there there is no free lunch though so i do want to call out a few caveats when we think about stateless workflows there are some requirements that we do talk about we talk about execution should be less than five minutes so you know these sit in memory so when you have these workflows and many of them that's taking up your memory at some point you could run out of available memory on your VM unless you're scaling out if you try to sort of have too many of these. So it's more of like, you know, do the processing and shut down. Uh, same with message size, this is related to memory as well. Obviously there's sort of a, a footprint that we do have inside of the service plan you're using. And if you have a lot of large messages, naturally that will create some instability. So our recommended guideline is 64 KB. I'm pretty sure if you go over 64 KB, you're not gonna get an, a runtime error, but that's basically guidance because uh, we want sort of a predictable 
reliable workflow r workload here. Also, synchronous pattern if you have a, a, a client caller, right? So this is, is sort of the typical mode where, you know, the client caller in this case can be that stateful workflow. It's kind of a handoff. Here, do some work and then get back to me. It's one of those things where you don't want these async. And when we say async, we're talking about basically like a callback pattern. Uh, that is something that isn't available um, or you shouldn't even attempt because the in order for those callback patterns to wait or to work, you need persistence, you need stateful from that perspective. So you can certainly do what I would call async in, in terms of say service bus messaging where you pull a message off a queue and then you go do some processing and then you sort of you know complete the process. That's technically async and that's completely fine. When we say async in this context, it's more of that callback pattern, the 202. Uh, and as I mentioned before, temporarily you can enable debugging, but that will impact performance and should only be used for troubleshooting and not for production message processing. So let's go in, let's just see a little bit of a demo on how we can get this set up. All right, so we're gonna use kind of a compare and contrast situation here. So I'm gonna do the same logic using just one stateful workflow. So that's the workflow that I'm in right now. And we're gonna go ahead and run this. And then what we're gonna do is then go ahead and see what this would look like with that stateful plus stateless combination. So let's just run this. I did run this just a few minutes ago just to kind of warm up the sort of app service. Uh, and we'll see like how long this takes to run. And let's just do a refresh. This will take a few seconds. All right, so 9.62 sec seconds. And if we take a look at sort of what's going on here, what we're going to do is we're going to receive a request from Salesforce. We're going to then do some processing, get an account record, get contact records for an account. Then we're going to do some synchronization with uh, Dataverse, right? So we're going to list some accounts, update the account, list the contacts, update the contact, and then basically complete processing. So in that case, we did see it was you know 9.62 seconds. If we head over to this particular scenario. What we have is a stateful workflow. And uh, let's just go ahead, let's run this first, and then I'll describe sort of the, the setup beneath this, under the hood here. So there we go, 3.04 seconds. So a savings of roughly six and a half seconds, give or take. Now, you know, so that's one thing. If you're looking to shave off some seconds, that's going to help you. The other thing is storage costs, right? So we, we don't have all of the storage uh, checkpointing that's taking place, and that contributes to the improved latency. So let's just take a look at how we set this up. So we've got the records or sorry, the trigger here, which is Salesforce. We're going to go get the opportunity and here we're doing the exact same processing. Um, so I'm not skipping any steps. Then what we're going to go do is we're going to go invoke a workflow and uh, that's going to be in this logic app. And what we're going to do is we're going to pass in basically the account ID. This is the message, essentially the data, that we need to get from Salesforce that will be used in our downstream processing. Now, we will then call that, that stateless workflow. It'll do all of the work for us, and then it'll respond back, uh, you know, with basically a response. In this case, we can see that the process completed successfully and that we synced one record, one contact. This is kind of where you need to build in some intelligence. The idea is that the stateless workflow is not going to be showing up in run history. So you you're, you're don't have that visibility that you might be looking for. So you need to build that into your response that says, hey, this failed and this is the exception or this, success, this succeeded and then provide some data that's relevant to the process. In this case, I know it succeeded because I had one contact that was processed. So think about how you would kind of build in some of that intelligence yourself. So that was the stateful workflow. Now let's look at the stateless workflow. And this will actually look quite similar to what, um, what I had done before. Now, you might be wondering, hey, why do you have run history records? Previously, on yesterday, I was doing some debugging and I did enable debug mode. You can see that it is currently off and I don't have any recent records for September 13th. So it is, it is off. Now let's take a look at the workflow. This should look quite similar. Now, instead of having the Salesforce connector, I do have this HTTP connector. And what I'm doing is I'm, I use the sample message coming out of that Salesforce connector 
to generate a schema. Then the rest of the items, I actually copied and pasted. Uh, I was able to copy the scope. Uh, that's a relatively new feature. I can copy the scope from the old or the stateless, sorry, the stateful workflow and paste it into this stateless workflow. So all of this will look exactly the same. Uh, I'm going to use that account ID that was passed in from the stateful workflow. I'm going to do all of the processing. Now I didn't need to make a few tweaks here because I need to like send that response back to the caller with some relevant information. So I've got my tri scope here that is going to do all of the processing. I've got a Boolean variable called process status that I'm going to set to true because at this point I know everything was completed successfully. Now I've got a, a catch scope here and here I'm just going to use the result expression on that tri scope just to sort of capture an exception message. And I did set when I initialized that variable, I did set it to false. Um, so basically like the default is false. So that's why I haven't updated it in that catch because I'm assuming it's false unless it's explicitly set to true. Then what I do is in my finally, and so for this particular scope, I'm going to run this when my, tr my scope catch was successful or when my scope catch was skipped because if my try scope was successful, this would be skipped. And then as a result, I'm just going to create a very simple message. I'm going to use that variable, the process status, and then I'm going to say, this is the healthy branch. I'm going to say, yep, the sync was complete. You know, how many outputs or how many contacts were processed. So I'm going to report that in the event I have an error, I'm going to say, you know, the status will be set to false. And then the message is actually coming from this compose. So I would get that feedback of the exception that previously failed. And so I send that back to the caller, in this case, that stateful workflow. And then I can go ahead and get some more insights uh, about that. I would be able to then sort of further investigate. Or if I needed to go ahead and do a retry, I would have the ability to do that because I can go ahead and resubmit from here as you just saw in the stateless workflow, I can't, there is no workflow to, um, to go ahead and to attach to. And, and like I said before, if you do need to enable debugging on that for temporary purposes, you certainly can go ahead and, and do that. So that uh, completes this video. And I think the key takeaway is that it's not an either or situation. It's not stateful or stateless. It can be stateful and stateless. And I think you can use this to your advantage where it makes sense. Um, if you're purely doing async messages and your storage costs are not a concern, you know, in my opinion, just use stateful. Um, you know, you get all of these sort of additional operational tools. But where it makes sense, I think this is a completely valid and, and relevant pattern to go ahead and use. Thanks for checking out this video. We'll talk to you again soon.